Coming to you live from the Splat Zone Towers. This is the Splat Zone. Welcome to the Splat Zone. I am your host, Mario After Party, alongside Nice1983. We are a monthly video cast slash podcast. However, we are bringing you a special bonus episode of the top 10 greatest video games of all time. Nice one, how you feel? Man, I'm super excited. Top 10 video games of all time? We finna start some debates. Oh yeah, definitely. However, before we get into the top 10, I just want to preface this by saying that we do have some criteria. Uh, two rules for our top 10 were, number one, it's console games only. So no arcade games, no PC games, no mobile gaming. Straight up console games, handhelds are included. And then the second rule was that basically nothing on a current generation system. Uh, we want to have some time for these games to sink in. Um, that way, you know, we know truly that they're the greatest of all time. So we want to give it a few years. So really, we're kind of looking at the 2012 time frame and earlier. So um, nothing on a new generation system. Um and then also, because we know that uh, you know our top tens are going to be different from your top tens, at the end of the episode, uh, Nice One is going to give you some information on how you can participate by sending us your own top ten. Um, especially because we know that you know Nice One and I we're '80s babies. '80s babies are going to have what? a different list than uh, you know '90s babies or millennial babies, especially since the games that you grew up on may be different. Than the games that we grew up on, um, but with that said, you know, like I said, nice one's going to get into the fan participation at the end of the episode. Um, but let's get to it, nice one. What is your number ten game? Number ten. First off, I want to preface by saying how hard it was to think of ten and stick to ten games because that, man, that is the biggest task I think I've ever done in my life, and uh, I sell insurance for a living, so. <laughs> Definitely. Number 10. I feel bad for putting this one as number 10 because I credit this game as making me a gamer. But number 10 is Donkey Kong Country for the SNES. That game is as tight of a platform as you could possibly get. Over 100 bonus levels. Bonus levels on top of like great sound design that has some of the best video game music to this day um the character designs we are still using that version of donkey kong to this day i don't think rare gets enough credit for for how much creativity they put into their version of donkey kong that it actually stood the test of time and nintendo hasn't messed with it um the inclusion of diddy kong the bad the badass bad guy king k rule uh just Lots of fun, and it gave Donkey Kong some real status. I mean, we hadn't had a Donkey Kong game since like 1981, and by the time we get it, we get some evolution to the character. So it is, it was a fantastic moment. Uh, want to do one little side note here. Uh, I was subscribed to Nintendo Power back in the day, and as a subscriber, before a couple months before the game launched, I was sent a VHS tape. Yes, we're 80s babies. VHS tapes are thing. Look them up, children. Uh, on this VHS tape, it was a promo tape from Nintendo basically pimping the game. It was a 22-minute video that just brainwashed me into wanting the game months before it came out. And this, guys, this is pre-internet. So this is how you got your information through video game magazines and through... Uh, through advertising like this, and Nintendo really blew my mind by sending me this VHS tape, and I begged, and I pleaded, I need this for Christmas, and I got it, and I loved it. Alright, my number 10 is Mario Party 4 for the Nintendo GameCube. I've always loved the Mario Party series, um, you can probably tell just because my gamer tag Mario After Party is a play on Mario Party, but I feel like Mario Party 4 is where they got it right. It's where they kind of perfected the formula. I feel like it had the best boards out of the entire series uh, to date. You know, the game, uh, it was the first game on the GameCube. The mini games were, were um, good. I don't know if they're the best in the series, but the, you know, 
I have some very fond memories um, of Mario Party 4. I actually made one of my sister's friends cry <laughs> we were playing because I stole her star. Now, we were playing on uh, Boo's Haunted Bash, which is probably um, the best board on that um, in that game. And that says a lot because that game has the best boards, hands down. And... Uh, I stole her star, and she, you know, she just burst into cheer, tears, and I was accused of cheating, and like everybody <laughs> else in the playing that game, just ganged up on me. Like if I was in a two-on-two player game, the person who was on my team would throw the game, so I couldn't win. Everyone was out to defeat me, and there was just a lot of drama, a lot of emotion. Um, it was just, you know, one of those games that. You were always going to remember, you know, just because Mario Party has that effect on people. It will destroy friendships. It will create drama. <laughs> and, you know, growing up, I just I, I have a lot of really funny memories about that game. That was a good game, man. So, with that said, moving on to number nine. Number nine. This is a little bit of a forgotten title because it came out the tail end of the SNES's lifespan. But Super Mario RPG. I only need to say one word to describe this game. Square. This is one of Square's best RPGs. Um, the only sad thing I gotta say about this game is that this is the last Square game for a Nintendo console until the GameCube. They skipped that on the 64. Uh, refusing to work with Nintendo again ever is what they said. I mean, they obviously didn't go that route. But there is a lot of cool stuff to this game. Uh, Mallow the Frog. Uh, there's a minecart stage that's great. Uh, Donkey Kong from Donkey Kong Country shows up in a cameo. He's all chained up. Um, the gameplay is great. Um, finally, we had a game... That Bowser wasn't the main villain. Actually, Bowser's in your party in this game. Uh, this game had a great story from start to finish. This game is so, so good. And at the time, it was putting out some really nice 3D. And uh, it was one of those things where you're like, this is on a Super Nintendo? Because it doesn't look like it could be, but it is. And uh, and it's, it's a great game because it's like, it takes all the homage that you that you gotta give a Mario game, but then they're not scared to go a little bit of the Final Fantasy VII route, or I'm sorry, the Final Fantasy route, and give you that traditional RPG. Such a good game. Uh, one more little piece of fun advice: if you haven't, get on YouTube and watch the Japanese commercial for this game. It is one of the best commercials I've ever had. Actually, if you're watching the video feed, I am putting this commercial on right now for your enjoyment. Go ahead, bro. Yeah, I just want to say, too, um, if you're listening to this as a podcast, um, definitely check out the YouTube video because there is some glorious, glorious, uh, you know, B-roll that we're using to where you can see all the games that we're talking about. Uh, but Mario RP Super Mario RPG is also my number nine as well. Um, you know, I totally agree with you. It had really awesome, lush graphics. They weren't quite as pretty as um, the uh, Donkey Kong Country game, but they were on the same level. You know, it was probably the second best looking game on the Super Nintendo. And, um, you know, it was the first time that Mario had ever been in, R in an RPG. So that game was kind of unprecedented. Uh, also, e what I liked about it was even though it was Square developed, there were no random battles. You know, you actually had to run into your opponent it kind of uh, made it a little bit easier to avoid battles, even though some of the enemies would move really fast. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, if you if you didn't want to fight, you didn't really have to. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed the battle system. Uh, timed hits, timed defense was an important part of that. It just kind of made it more interactive. Um, you know, and then the story was great, and you got to play as Bowser. I mean, how many Mario games do you get to play as Bowser? It was pretty awesome to well, have him on your team. Yeah, if you're not playing a Mario Party game, it's very rare that you're playing as Bowser. Um, yeah, even in Mario Party, you can't play Bowser. You play Bowser Jr. So, you know, it's 
at least, you know, as one of the characters that goes around the board. So, I don't know. I, you know, for me, um, it was different from a lot of the RPGs that came out in that time. And um, especially for the, for the Super Nintendo, it was definitely my favorite RPG for the Super Nintendo. Yeah, it has like so, that Chrono Trigger effect, too, with the uh, random battles. And you're almost free to go anywhere you want in the Mario RPG. Uh, preface this... Even though Mario After Party told you you can avoid battles, don't because that final boss is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, with that said, let's move on to number eight. Number eight. Number eight is probably one of the newer games on my list. Um, but it goes without mention that The Last of Us is my number eight game. Um, the Last of Us is one of those games... I know lately we've been getting games where choice is what reigns supreme you have the ability to choose how your character acts and you know that makes a lot of these games more interesting because you feel like you have direct control over the character's thinking this game kind of takes you out of that and it's only interested in telling you the story that it wants you to to see uh, and what you get are some of the best graphics that the playstation 3 can output you get one of the best stories I have ever read. If The Last of Us was a movie, it would win Oscars. If The Last of Us was a book, it would win whatever award that books get. It would be on the New York Times bestseller. Um, you really start to care about these people. Um, you play as Joel throughout the majority of the game. And you really find yourself invested in the in the female character, the, the sidekick, uh, Ellie. You you really in real life want to protect this girl because that's not just the point of the game, but through through the interactions and the dialogue, uh, you really start to feel that these are real people. They're not game characters. They feel real. They act real. They even talk to each other like randomly throughout the game, and you get a little bit of each character's history. You get a lot of like great things from these characters. Uh. The end, which I won't spoil, is literally one of the best endings in video game history. It goes without saying how good this game is. Uh, there was no way I could not include it in a top 10. It is it is just that damn good. If you have not played The Last of Us, you have two different avenues. You can play it on the PS3, or you can get the HD remake on the PS4. This game is a must-play if you haven't played it. All right, my number eight is Crash Team Racing for the PlayStation 1. Uh, it is, to this day, the best racing game I've ever played, and it's better than any Mario Kart game. Before you hate on me, though, I know there's a lot of Mario Kart fans out there. You really need to uh, try this game. It was um, pretty awesome. And uh, what I liked about it was, um, you know, it had a lot of uh, things that were similar to Mario Kart in it, but... Um, it was a really satisfying game. The game mechanics were, were great. The uh, the drifting system and, and uh, was was really good. Um, it was actually the first kart game to implement the uh, jump system where you get the extra boost for, for jumping off um, like the ramps and stuff, which Mario Kart ended up using after uh, Crash Team Racing. It was actually the final Crash Bandicoot game developed by Naughty Dog. Um, and... What was a little bit different about it, though, was that it had boss races. So, like, after you um, got to certain points in the game, you would race against a boss one-on-one, -on -one, and you had to beat him to unlock that that character, and then you could race as that boss later, which um, kind of Mario Kart series has never done that. It, it made it stand out a little bit. Um, also... It had an awesome battle mode that Mario Kart wishes it had. You know, as great a game as Mario Kart 8 is, um, we all know that Nintendo pretty much considers battle mode an afterthought. You know, they didn't even make battle stages for Mario Kart 8 this time around. They just decided to make shortened ver versions of each track, and uh, you just go around in a circle, which is not fun. In Crash Team Racing, the battle mode was pretty awesome. All the stages were um, designed really well. And, you know, with the multi-tap uh, for the PlayStation, you know, you could race with four of your friends and, and battle with four of your friends. And 
it was just a really awesome racing game. So it was, you know, to this day, it is my favorite racing game. Funny side note on this game. Uh, a couple months ago, my fiance was describing to me another kart game when I was playing Mar while I was playing Mario Kart 8. She was like, it had this orange guy, had a big nose, and I was like, are you talking about Crash Bandicoot? She was like, yeah, but you were racing, and I was like, oh. So when I was showing my fiance the top 10 list, and she saw that uh, Mario After Party had put Crash Team Racing as his number 8, she was pleased that it was on the list, but displeased that it was so low, so you got some explaining to do when you come back home, bro. I mean, it's in my top ten. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what's your number seven? Nice one. Number seven. There is no way that anybody should be able to get through a top ten list without having at least one Legend of Zelda game on there. Uh, mine is The Wind Waker. For so many reasons. For so many reasons. Uh, reason number one, it is freaking charming. I know a lot of people have lots of things to say about cell shading. I don't care. You can't make you can't look at the Wind Waker version of Link and not think the character is adorable. It's freaking little and cute. Uh, that being said, the Wind Waker is probably one of the most visceral Legend of Zelda games, just due to that ending. Where Link basically stabs Ganondorf in the head with the Master Sword. And that's not going to get a spoiler alert because that game's been out since like 2002. If you haven't played it, that's your fault. This is 13 years old, guys. Um, such a good game. Um, they changed so much of the Legend of Zelda, like, uh, canon. Not, no, not canon. That's not the right word. Uh, the status quo. Uh you know, removing Epona the horse and replacing it with the King of Red Lions, the boat. Um, the dungeons, if you want to call them dungeons. That's that's the first major change. They're not really dungeons. They're but you know they are, but they aren't. Uh, the the whole water world feel of it. They basically did water world better than Kevin Costner. Um, just all the characters in the game feel right. Uh, the gameplay, of course, is super tight, super nice. Um, I just can't say enough good things about that game. It is, it is fun to the last to the last moment, um, and that like I said that that ender is so shocking, uh, and it it does feel like the successor to Ocarina of Time, um, which just barely didn't make this list, uh, but it's the sequel to Ocarina of Time that that people deserve, and I don't know I don't think enough people have played The Wind Waker. I think they need to get on this game because it's charming. And it's and it's just a control wise. It is one of the best Zelda games. Period. Right. My number seven is the cult classic Xeno Gears for PlayStation One. Um, the art style and the graphics were really colorful and unique. But what really stood out for that game, um, graphically at least, or in its presentation, was the anime cutscenes. Oh yeah. They were they were beautiful. Um, they really moved the storyline along, and um, you know, the battle mode in that game, uh, there were two different modes uh, where you could battle in a human form or in a mech, which gave it a lot of variety. There was a lot of, um, you know, different uh, strategic elements with it as far as um, using combos and different um, button inputs for each move. Um, as, as far as all the RPGs I've played, it's probably, um, if not the best, it's, it's one of the best battle systems um, that I've ever played, you know, even, even level grinding, which sometimes is not so fun in RPGs was, um, really not such a big endeavor in Xenogears, but really the reason why Xenogears is number seven on my list is because of the storyline. Storyline was just excellent. It, it had an amazing storyline and the character development was really second to none. I don't think I've ever played, um, an, an RPG where the character development was was that deep, and uh, they really did a great job on that. They covered a lot of really deep themes um, like philosophy and religion, and I felt like they did it for the most part without um, going 
too far overboard. It w the storyline was still easy to follow for the most part. Um, and overall, that is why I have it as number seven. Yeah. So we need to, that also, on to before we go on to number six, uh, that's one of those games that came out like the when Square was hitting on all cylinders, man. That That's really, Square really found their stride on the PlayStation 1, man. And that's one of those games that came out right in there, like, that crux of, like, really good games that Square was producing. So I'm glad that made somebody's list. So, number six. Number six for me is Mario Kart Double Dash. Um, this is the most innovative Mario Kart game up until Mario Kart 8, I would say. Uh, I love the fact where you, that you have two characters driving at once. Or one character drives while the other one holds like, and and fires the items. It's it's really well designed. It has some of the most enduring Mario Kart courses. Um, really great cor course design. Uh, at some of them we have. There's a course in that game that has like seven laps. Uh, Baby Park, which just came out as DLC for uh, Mario Kart Eight. Uh, obviously, you had a Yoshi's, uh, the Yoshi stage where you race on a track that looks like a Yoshi. Really, really strong designs. Uh, you also got a lot of firsts in that game. Uh, you got your, you got Waluigi, the first time he was in a Mario Kart game. You got uh, King Boo, the first time he was in a Mario Kart game. Diddy Kong, first time he's in a Mario Kart game. Lots of firsts, lots of firsts, and and they do it so well. The, the one of the most tight racing games in the in Mario Kart series. Uh, I know some of them feel looser. This is the one where they really get it right. Um, from from start to finish, they got this game right. Uh, and this was one of the best games on the GameCube. Super fun. Fast. Uh, this game was fun to even play by yourself. Um, I would always have friends come over and play it. But when, you know, you know after they had gone, I'd still be playing this game for hours. It, it, it was just that good um there's just so much more i can say it's it's just literally one of the best games in that gamecube era for me all right my number six is shadow of the colossus for the playstation 2 um if ever there was you know someone trying to prove the argument that uh video games are actually art this game would be the one that you know, makes that argument because it was just every moment of this game is beautiful and gorgeous. It's probably graphically the best game I've ever played. You know, everything in this game, it's, it's beautiful, but it's also a massive open world. Um, it's interactively cinematic. And what I mean by that is that it's not just cinematic in the cutscenes. It's like, Every moment you're playing this game feels cinematic. You know, the sound effects, um, the, you know, music, and, you know, just the fact that this, the premise of this game is, you know, you have to defeat 16 colossi, and that is it. There are 16 boss fights, and there are no other enemies in this game. And each boss is also a puzzle. So, you know, it's a it's a boss game, but it's also a puzzle game at the same time. And that is the is the beauty of it, you know, because you're you're trying to figure out how to defeat these massive colossi that are hundreds and hundreds of feet tall and you're just a little speck and every time you run up on them you just think, you know, oh god, you know, <laughs> how am I going to beat this one? And there's so much satisfaction and reward every time you defeat one. It's just one of the most amazing games that I have ever played. Um, and with that, we're going to move on to our top five. Nice one. What do you have as number five? Man, top five. This is where I started sweating bullets. I know before we even get into this, we had talked about this a little bit before, and I had sent you a top ten initially. And upon, like, a lot of, like, thinking and whatnot, my top five ended up changing 
dramatically. Um, just because, man, it's it's really hard to boil things down to a top ten. But once you get to that top five, the criteria for a top five game becomes <laughs> a lot more demanding. But with that, I think this game on my top five absolutely deserves to be in most gamers' top fives. That's Pokemon Gold and Silver um, for the Game Boy Color. These games... Let's start with the basics. It takes everything that you love from Pokemon Red and Blue, and it ups the ante. You get 100 new Pokemon. Um, that's the first thing that, that blows your mind is more Pokemon, yes. Uh, the second thing that really blows your mind is you're playing as a different character. They didn't. You didn't have to play as Red and Blue. You got to play as Gold and Silver or Crystal if you got that version. Um, the first thing you should notice right away is that these games are in color because they were for the Game Boy Color. So that right there, just they kept, just kept ramping things up. Uh, one of my favorite features is the day and night feature in that game. Um, it really, especially when it came to things like uh, the evolutions, where you could get an Espeon or an Umbreon just depending on the time of day. Uh, but my favorite, favorite, favorite feature that this game has is a whole extra game it starts off like the original you got eight gems and your elite four but after you beat the elite four in this game you get the original eight gems from Kanto you get Johto and you get Kanto and you get those sec you get to that second eight gems and you realize that this world has evolved like gym leaders are different like Giovanni is no longer the gym leader uh, Blue is the gym leader for Viridian City. Uh, Koga's gone. It's just so good. So damn good this game is. Um, and little known fact about this game. They couldn't get it to fit on the cartridge initially. They couldn't even get the first eight gems to fit on the cartridge. But uh, former president Satoru Iwata, may he rest in peace, came into Game Freak and said, let me help you. And because of Iwata, we not only got the first eight gems, we got the whole second half of the game with the second eight gems. Iwata, thank you for that because that just made that game so much better. Well, for my number five, I have Final Fantasy VII. Um, probably one of the most critically acclaimed RPGs of all time. Uh, growing up as a kid... I always loved playing RPGs from a very young age, but Final Fantasy VII was the first time that I remember an RPG having so much hype, like mainstream. And, you know, I remember all my friends talking about it. Um, I was uh, living in Germany at the time, and I was actually probably the first one in Germany to have that game because the day it was released in the States, my dad bought it, before getting on a plane and coming back home. And I had that game before it came out um, on base, which um, I grew up around a military base. So, you know, for me, like, it, it just, there's so many memories. There was so much anticipation for that game, and it just lived up to everything. It was one of those rare games where it just, it did everything right. You know, it may... Um, it may not have had the best battle system, you know, but the Materia was probably one of the most complex and deepest battle systems there there are. The summons were amazing. Um, you know, the music and the soundtrack, um, you know, were really, to this day, um, people still use those, um, you know, riffs as ringtones on their phone because it's one of the few games where you will still remember um the soundtrack you know there's a lot of soundtracks to games where people say oh this this game was amazing it had great soundtrack but really how many games can you actually remember a lot of these tunes from you know this is one of those rare games where it's it's just that good that um people still will recognize the chocobo theme or still play the little intro theme on the piano 
And, um, you know, it's just, it was one of those games that um, really pushed RPGs into the mainstream. And um, for me, just the whole vibe of, of that whole game with the storyline and everything, um, them having, you know, Square having the audacity to kill a main character off so early in the game, too, um, while giving you enough time to get attached to that character before killing them off. I mean, it was just um, a masterpiece in gaming. So with that, moving on to number four. Number four. Number four is a great game for me, personally. Uh, number four is Paper Mario Thousand Year Door for the uh, Nintendo GameCube. This is actually the sequel to uh, Paper Mario, uh, which in its of itself is sort of a pseudo sequel to Mario RPG. Uh, like I said earlier, Square said they would never develop another game for Nintendo. Um, you know, just a little bit of behind the scenes drama that they had over formats, uh, cartridge versus CD. Uh, but Paper Mario Thousand Year Door gets everything right. Uh, it assembles an, an eclectic cast of uh, side characters for Mario. Uh, you, <laughs> you get to play as uh, ghosts, Yoshis, Goombas. Uh, the, the, the level design was great because it's got this cardboard cutout feel uh, on top of like these lush 3D backgrounds. Um, Again, it's one of these games where the Mario RPG series, which you know, we're, I'm just gonna call it by that. They are they have some of the best storylines uh, for a Mario game period. Just great story. The music is so catchy. Uh, the mechanics are are really tight, especially like Mario RPG, like uh, Mario After Party said earlier. Uh, it the it it has the, like those action commands where. You have to physically tap the A button if you want Mario to increase the strength of an attack. Uh, they do that so well. They, they implement that system well. Um, again, this is one of those games where you can... One of these RPGs where you can avoid battle entirely. Um, but, you know, doing that, it, that's a catch-22 because you see, even though you see it coming, you might need that experience later on. Um, it's just a, it's such a good game with this adorable art style. Um, it's you know it's it's not a surprise that the Paper Mario franchise has actually endured um, after games after this game. Um, unfortunately, though, it's one of the more experimental franchises for Nintendo. Like lately, they've gone a little bit off the en the deep end with the Paper Mario franchise, but this game gets everything right the rpg elements the story elements the music elements even even the sound effects are great in this game just just an all-out fun game and a masterpiece for the gamecube all right for my number four i have pokemon gold and silver for the game boy color i know you had it as your number five but i liked it just a little bit better so i have it as my number four um the reason why I have Pokemon Gold and Silver as, as number four instead of a, another Pokemon game is because I think that was the most revolutionary um, game in the series. It did the most to push the series to another level and raise the bar. Um, it introduced uh, the friendship that you have with your Pokemon, the friendship meter. Um, day and night were introduced. Genders were introduced so you could breed. Um, it also, like the timed events that would happen on certain days of the week. I mean, how many games back then did you play, or even today, where, you know, it would determine your schedule? Like, you knew something was going to happen on Friday, and you had to, you know, play the game on that day. Or, or you, you would, um, you know, stay up late just so you could catch Hoot Hoot, because, you know, he only came out at night. You know, like, <laughs> things like that. I mean, it also introduced um, Pokemon being able to hold items. And all these features um, became really important later as the series progressed, and, and the series kind of used all these and, and developed them more, but they were all introduced 
in gold and silver, and then also um, dark and steel Pokemon were introduced, which even to this day are still like some of the most exotic and mysterious Pokemon, and they're always you know really fun to play with. Um, and this is one of those games too where I have a lot of memory of drama that this game caused. Um, <laughs> I remember, I think. Um, there was one time where my sister wanted me wanted to trade her Onyx to me so that it could evolve into a Steelix, and then I would trade it back to her. Well, um, she did. She she traded it to me, and it evolved into a Steelix. But you know, earlier that day, she had beaten me in one of our you know Pokemon battles, and I was still salty from it. So on the way back, when um, Steelix was was going back, if, if you remember back in the day, uh, you had to trade by connecting your Game Boys together with the little uh, USB cable the link type cable. thing. So the cable would be connecting the games. Well, while the, the Pokemon was leaving my system and going to her system, I unplugged the cable. And Pokemon disappeared. And I was like, oh, your Steelix fell on the floor. Oh, it's on the floor. And she was pretty mad, crying. <laughs> The Steelix wasn't on either of our systems at that point anymore. It literally got deleted. So <laughs> she was pissed because, like, she had been training that Onyx pretty hard. And now <laughs> I just literally deleted it. I'm a horrible person. And Brianna, if you're listening to this, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> and with that, we are going to go on to number three. One quick thing. Uh, a lot of the features that you mentioned, um, because of those features really developed the meta game for Pokemon to the point where if it weren't for things like breeding and item holding, the meta game as we know it is non-existent for Pokemon. So super, right. super yeah. important to the franchise. Uh, so we are at number three. Number three. This probably the easiest game to put on my top ten. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. I man, this game. Right, right from the the moment the game starts, and you get that that uh that West Coast gangster rap theme opening the game. Uh, you you meet CJ. Uh, the voice cast in that game, so good. Man, Samuel L. Jackson as a dirty cop, very cool. Uh, the story in the game, the rags to riches, has never been told better. Uh, I like how it kind of parodies the, uh, LA riots, which happened 92, um, I believe. They did a good job of, uh, portraying that in the game. Uh, things like gang warfare are introduced in, in this game. Uh, but that's not what my favorite feature is. My favorite feature in this game has got to be the, the customization, uh, features. No Grand Theft Auto game before or since has had the level of customization of your character that San Andreas has. It is phenomenal what you can make your character wear and how you can make your character look right down to the point where you actually have to eat and work out in this game if you want your character to be buff. You actually have to teach him forms of martial arts so that he knows how to fight. And you can have him learn like karate or boxing. And it completely changes the way that CJ fights within the game using hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, this is one of those few games where using cheat codes is actually fun. Where you get like a... You use the cheat codes and you get like an arsenal. You get like your own personal arsenal of weaponry. It's so good uh, outside that. Uh, everything about that game ramps up everything that Grand Theft Auto 3 did and everything Vice City did and yo CSR Contemporary Soul Radio don't swing at your wife swing with your wife hey <laughs> if you don't know that joke stop listening to this podcast I'm, no I'm kidding don't don't stop listening to the podcast guys just a great game man it is that's I have it as my number three as well so in that regard we're on the same page um you know the open world just kept getting bigger with all the Grand Theft Auto games, and with San Andreas, you know they added, um, you know basically the 
uh, GTA equivalent of LA, Las Vegas, and San Francisco, and each of those cities had their own vibe, their own feel. They were both, or all three of them were um, large, and there was a lot to do. And that was the first game where you were you could swim, where the water wouldn't kill you. So that opened up the world even more. So everything just felt so huge in that game. And um, you know, I remember just spending hours. Um, after I beat the game, just playing the turf war mode where you, you know, you're trying to take over, you know, as much turf as you can and defeat the other gangs. I mean, there was just so much to do in that game. Really, the reason why it's number three on my list is because it was fun. It was just pure fun. And everything that you could do in that game, just, you know, you could spend hours on so many different um, features and side quests and mini games. Um, even after you beat the game, there's so much replayability to it. And one of the things that I really like about it, too, is that, um, like you were saying about the storyline, um, not only is it a rags to riches storyline, but, you know, it's one of those rare games where it actually has diversity in it. A lot of times, you know, we see that the main character in a video game is, like, white or Asian. Well, this game focuses on a black character and his struggle. And it would have been really easy for them, too, to, like, kind of mess up and make it seem cheesy. Um, you know, going to the hood and, and seeing everybody, you know, all these ratchet characters and all these gangbangers. But the way that um, they captured the atmosphere of, you know, CJ's world and all the voice acting that goes into it, you know, it, it never felt cheesy. It always felt genuine and real and... Um, it was just, you know, it was like something out of, like, almost as if, you know, it had been scripted by um, a Hollywood writer. Because oh. it was just one of those games that just really captured that environment and that world so perfectly. Yeah, it um, has that Boys in the Hood feel to it. Like, if you've seen Boys in the Hood, this game is very, very um, on that level. And Boys in the Hood is one of, like my all-time favorite movies. So it was it's like playing through that movie. Uh just, just Yeah, and it's rare for a video game to to kind of capture that. Exactly. Yeah, there, there's just too much good to say about this game um and it hit at the right time. Um uh Rockstar you know, going into Grand Theft Auto 3, we thought that was the best they could do and then going into Vice City you think that's the best they can do, and then you get to San Andreas, and it's like, what the fuck did they do here? Because it's so good. Um, side note, I love how uh, Ken Rosenberg is used in uh, San Andreas. Ken Rosenberg making his appearance in uh, <laughs> Grand Theft Auto 3, uh, just connecting the Grand Theft Auto universes, if you will. And the radio stations are great in this game. Just really great. I listened. I spent hours just driving around uh, San Andreas listening to the radio station because they got the best music from from that era, the the early nineties, on every station. So good, man. So good. All right, we're getting closer to the top. Nice one. What's your number two? My number two is Mario Galaxy. This game. This game was a reason to own a Wii. Uh, we finally got a Mario game on the Wii in full 3D. Um, and it's beautiful. And it's beautiful in a way that you would have expected like a PlayStation 3 game or an Xbox 360 game to look at the time. And when you realize that the Wii could not do high definition and you were using component cables, you know, your red and yellow cables and not an HDMI, and you see how this game looks... It's it's mind-boggling how good this game looks. It it really holds its own. Um, this was game of the year in 2007 from IGN. This game got a perfect 10 from IGN, and a lot of other uh, video game review sites. This game is one of the highest reviewed Mario games. Period. It's it's glorious. The the music, fully orchestrated soundtrack. For a Mario game to have a fully orchestrated soundtrack. That that right there is incredible. It just it just 
perfect soundtrack. The the gameplay is super tight. The jumping from planet to planet feels great. Uh, the power ups in this game are fun. Um, being able to play as Mario with these power ups just really, really, really well done. Uh, outside of that, the two player mode has its uh, advantages. It's not really a two player mode, but it, there's kind of a two player mode that makes it a little bit more fun. Um, just, just, just so much good about this game, and it shows you that even though Nintendo doesn't always like to mess with the most powerful hardware, they are masters at making their hardware do the best things possible. Uh, their hardware makes everything. I mean, th th like their their game design supersedes the hardware itself, and. It's one of those games that makes you realize that Nintendo, they are kings. They know how to make a good, fun, really well-designed game. Alright, my number two is Snatchers for the Sega CD. Uh, Snatcher is one of those cult classic games that not a lot of people know about. If you've never heard of it, uh, I really suggest you, you check it out. I think... It's available for other platforms now. I think you might be able to play it for the uh, one of the PlayStation platforms. But regardless, um, you know, for a game that came out in 1994, it was really ahead of its time. And as hard as this list was for me to make a top 10, because there's so many great games that I just couldn't put on it, um, that I agonized over, this game will always have a special place in my heart. And I knew this game had to be in my top 10. Um, it has probably, not probably, definitely the best story of any game I have ever played. I'm surprised that they haven't made this into a movie, because this story wasn't just good for a video game. It was good for any media, you know, any medium of media. Like, this is a story that could be turned into a blockbuster Hollywood film. Basically, the, uh, the premise is that it's set in the future. It's got this cyberpunk, Blade Runner-influenced atmosphere. Uh, it's set in, I believe, 2047 in Neo Kobe, Japan. It takes place after um, a major biological um, catastrophe, which kills um, over half of the world's population. And it focuses on the main character, um, who is a junker, and, which is somebody that uh, is supposed to take out these robots who s basically snatch people's bodies, thus the name Snatcher. Um, they do it by killing the person and then um, creating an artificial skin over their um, metal frame and then impersonating that person so that they can influence, you know, politics or government or you know the economy in some way shape or form they're trying to take over by using that now the only way that you can tell a snatcher apart from a human is that the the artificial skin that they're using um is very sensitive even in winter time they have to use sunscreen or else they'll get melanoma and their skin will decay and that's one of the the signs that uh the characters using the game to try to pick apart who's a snatcher and who's not. And um, this game also had a lot of voice acting, which isn't really a surprise when you look back on it in hindsight because it was developed by Hideo Kojima, same guy that developed Metal Gear Solid series, which are you know fully voice acted games. This game was, was the game that really... Um, set the standard and was ahead of its time because in 1994 it had cinematic quality voice acting um it for the most part it really wasn't cheesy it was pretty spot on it uh progressed the storyline the music i still remember to this day some of the music because it was just um so well composed it had a really interesting point and click style rpg that they mixed with the shooter for the battle sequences um, most point-and-click style RPGs usually aren't that interesting, 
but because the story was so good and because they mixed it up with this like um, shooter type element for the uh, uh, battle scenes, which there was a gun available for the game. I never got it, but I just used my controller. But it did kind of... Um, it, it, it made it the game unlike any other RPG I've ever played. And just, um, you know, like I said, the, the voice acting and the story are what really drove this game into the cult classic status. Um, and one day I really hope somebody makes it into a movie because it's just, it would translate perfectly. It's already influenced heavily from the Blade Runner film. That's where uh, Kojima got his influences from. So it's already really influenced from a movie. So to make it into a movie would be really easy. Um, and with that said, we are moving on to the number one greatest game of all time. Nice one. What do you got? Man, my number one game is also on your list at a much lower number. We'll have a conversation about that after we get off the show. <laughs> my game... I want to preface why I think this game. I want to tell you why this game is before I tell you the game. It is not often that you that characters in a one-off game are so enduring. Enduring to the point where when you kill one of them off, that you, the player, feel like the weight of that character's death. And you know what it means to the in-game characters that this character has died. Um, this game was revolutionary for its time. We are talking the f like first real RPG to be in full 3D um, with cinematic cutscenes that that really upped the ante and really made Square known for their 3D cutscenes. This game is the is the game that really puts Square on the map. For their, their 3D cutscenes and their level design and the materia system in this specific game, there is not enough that can be said about how good the materia system is. Um, it really makes that game's combat that much smarter than anything that came before it. And I don't think they've been able to really replicate it since. Uh, a lot of other games in this series have come out where... I don't think the material system feels as good. Um, the main character is one of those characters that makes kind of makes your heart bleed because you know they're they're thrust into something that they don't necessarily want for themselves. Um, yet they are the only hope for survival. Um, this is one of those games where the villain is sympathetic uh, to some degree, like his backstory is so good in and of itself that he could have had his own game and I would have wanted to play that. Uh, everything is good. Uh, and my game is Final Fantasy VII. Uh, for all those reasons and so many more, uh, even the mini games in Final Fantasy VII are spectacular. Uh, like the G-Bike scene where you're racing uh, down the, 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 the bridge on the motorcycle is one of the most fantastic mini games in video game history. Uh, and for an RPG to have mini games like that was so like intuitive, so so counter progressive to the whole traditional RPG. Um, and it's just so good. And it is a long game. It it it's one of those games where you invest your time in it. And when it's all said and done. It's worth it. It feels completely worth it. Like every hour, every minute, every second you spent in that world was well spent. And you feel like you're part of that world. There's not a lot of games, in my opinion, that make you feel like you are part of that world. And everything you do in that game carries weight. Um, from winning a battle to losing a battle... To, to that you know to that character being off you know pretty early in the game you feel the weight and you feel what happens you feel what these characters feel and to this day that death is one of like the most shocking deaths in video game history 
Um, this game has been so good, it's so good that it's had numerous spinoffs um, from anime to to other games. And after years of begging Square to give us a remake, they're finally caving, and we are finally going to get a remake for the PS4. Um, so I really look forward to getting back into that world, especially with whatever you know, graphical changes they want to make to it to bring it, you know, up to date with how video games look now. But even, but, you know, that being said, this game, I still think, really holds weight in its visuals. It's one of those games where it's, it's actually aged well. Uh, and I, I think that can be said about most of the other games on this list. But I think Final Fantasy VII aged well. I mean, they may, it might seem a little rudimentary, but the graphics aren't really the selling point for this game. It's it's this great story. Back then, they did use it as a selling point. But they were almost an afterthought to actually how good the story in this game is. And that's why it's my number one. Well said. All right. Continuing on from the Hideo Kojima reference that I dropped in my last game. Number one for me is Metal Gear Solid for the PlayStation 1. Um, that game, you know, if um, if Snatchers, you know, set the bar for, for voice acting, Metal Gear Solid definitely raised it. Um, that game, you know, pushed the levels of what, how a game could be cinematic. I think that was one of the first games that came out where um, I remember people telling me that, you know, they would be watching one of their friends play that game and, you know, they didn't realize that, you know, they were playing a game. They thought that their friend was watching a movie at first. Because even in the in the opening scene of Metal Gear Solid, um, you're playing the first couple minutes of the game while the credits are still rolling. So it's like a movie. It's, it's so cinematic. And, um, you know, that game uh, was so creative. In, in other ways too, you know, just, um, I don't know if it was the first stealth game to ever come out, but it was definitely the first stealth game of that style of stealth gameplay to come out because it really was not possible to do those kind of things until the PlayStation came out and you were able to play a game in 3D with that, that kind of AI that was smart enough to notice, um, you know, the sounds that you made if you ran too fast by them or, you know, an AI that could detect your footprints in the snow or, like, if you were... If the cardboard box you were hiding in was in an unusual location. You know, all that stuff. Um, it was just, you know... It was one of the rare games that really discouraged um, violence. And, and is at least in the first half of the game, most of it... They do. They don't want you to engage the enemy. They want you to sneak around them um, without killing them. Uh, and then you know the boss battles were also really creative too. Like I remember the Psycho Mantis battle. You know, he's there reading your memory card, telling you what games you like to play, <laughs> um, pretending to change the channel, using the Rumble controller to vibrate across the table, and like. Eventually, you have to um, move your controller in the in from player one to the player two slot to defeat him. I mean, that game breaks the fourth wall constantly in these really quirky but really funny ways. Um, that is kind of um, you know typical for a, a Kojima game, and you know it just does such a good job. Also, you know when it comes to music. Um, as, as great as some of these soundtracks have been on some of the games I've previously referenced, I would have to say Metal Gear Solid probably has overall the best soundtrack. It's, you know, it was composed by, now correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was Hans Zimmer, right? I mean, I believe you're this, right. this is a guy who composes soundtracks for um, Hollywood movies. They, they got a guy that actually makes soundtracks for movies. To make a soundtrack for this game so you know this game from start to finish is cinematic on every level the storyline too um you know the even though the voice acting was great you know it it also helped push the story along 
which is, you know, on the same level as any Hollywood thriller, a good Hollywood thriller, not just an average one. I mean, these, this game got it right on so many levels. The reason why it's my number one isn't, isn't just because of one aspect of, of the game. It, it's because the gameplay was amazing, the story was amazing, the music was amazing. You know, it had all these extra little features. Like, after you beat the game, there was a ranking system. I remember you could go online and, um, you know, input your code to see how you ranked against uh, other people. Uh, there was some replayability uh, in the fact that, depending on which ending you got, you could get um, a certain item which would give you, like, um, in invisibility, which could let you, like, sneak up on the guards and play around with them and no one could see you or... Um, there was another um, feature I forget, but you, there, you know, depending on whether Meryl lived or died, you got a certain item, so you could go back in the game and and play it again. And it, it was just a really special game, um, and that is why I have it as my number one. Uh, before we sign off, though, we do want to kind of wind down with one honorable mention, just a game that you know was was memorable, but just wasn't quite good enough to make your top ten. Uh, is there any honorable mentions you want to give a shout out to, nice one? Yeah, uh, this one, I, I pined over not putting this one on the list, but uh, Donkey Kong Country just as did out in my opinion. That would be Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Um, that game, there's, a lot can be said about the Sonic games, but this game in particular um, is really, it's like the last great, great Sonic game. Um, it also it had the the uh, functionality of the uh, the Sonic Three and Knuckles, where you plugged it into the adapter, and Knuckles would get his own game as part of that game. Um, level design again, Yuji Naka, the creator of Sonic the Hedgehog, his level design fantastic with the alternate paths for both Sonic and Knuckles to explore. Uh, all the power ups in that game feel right. Uh, the 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 stage design again is it's just really pretty and the game the thing that Sonic games lack now this game had speed um, it was fast it played fast and it looked good while it played fast um, this is back in the day when 30 frames per second was like the standard this game ran at all 30 frames per second and it looked amazing uh, on top of that it just had an excellent score um, for you know it being all chip tunes, just really played well. The sound effects in that game great. Uh, the Eggman boss battles are so fun. Uh, love these you know in the early goings of the game where you're being chased and Robotnik is or Eggman whichever name you want to call him is dropping like missiles on over over your head and you have to avoid them. Super fun. Um, of course, that game had some two-player mode where the second player could play as Tails and and fly Sonic around. Just a lot of fun. Um, it was so close to making the list, but Donkey Kong Country really just edged it out just to its graphical superiority. But it, it definitely deserved a place on a top 10 list, just not mine. If we had done top 20, this definitely would have made the cut. Yeah, my honorable mention is Super Street Fighter 2 for the Sega Genesis. <clears throat> uh, originally on my rough draft list for my top 10, I had it in the top 10, but, you know, it just got uh, edged out for one reason or another. But um, it was a great game. Uh, I had both systems that it was released on, but once I found out that Nintendo had censored the Super Nintendo version, I was like, you know, obviously going to get this Sega Genesis one with the blood and all of it because Nintendo edited out all the blood with sweat in their version. Um, also, the Genesis just had a better control scheme. With if you bought the controller that had the um, the six button controller with three across the, uh, the top, three across the bottom, it just worked better for a fighting game. So the Genesis version, in my opinion, was superior. I know graphically, a lot of people think that the Super Nintendo version was better, but uh, it really was so small that. You know, it, it wasn't significant. Now, 16 um, and 16-bit is 16-bit. Yeah, it, it just, 
you know, there was less slowdown on the Genesis version, so in my opinion, it, it looked better too. Um, it also had more game modes, uh, but irregardless, it's not really about which version was better. It's just Super Street Fighter 2 was a great game. Street Fighter games have a lot of um, surprisingly deep character development, but the four new characters that they added for Super Street Fighter 2 were actually also really um, engaging, and they became really popular in the series later on. Cammy uh, has always yeah. been really popular. DJ, you know, um, T Hawk, uh, Fei Wong, they, they all brought unique fighting styles. They were all really fun to use. I remember spending a lot of time with all four of those new characters, um, you know, and they, you know, uh, Capcom definitely spent a lot of time making sure that even though they were only adding four characters, they were definitely going to have a big impact in the game, and uh, that's just, you know, that was probably the first technical fighting game that I ever played. Um, well, not Super Street Fighter 2, but uh, Street Fighter 2 and then Super Street Fighter 2, so that was, I guess, the first... Uh, series I played that was just a really technical fighting game where you had to memorize a lot of button combinations and and everything and you know it really wasn't um, quite good enough to make my top ten but just want to throw it out there for uh, honorable mention just because it was a good game and it was important to me as my development uh, of a gamer um, but um, with that said we are going to sign off with one last bit of information. Nice one is going to give you um, all that information of how you can send in your top 10 list and why you think those games are the top 10 greatest games of all time uh, in your opinion. And you know, you can also even let us know what you think about our list, how they compare with your list and you know, what you think was, was good or bad about it. Um, so nice one. Take it away. All right. So, I want to preface this by saying the first person to send us their top 10 list will get two things. We will mention them, but we'll get a couple things. We will mention them by name in the next episode of the Splat Zones in December, which will be our year in review episode. Um, second, they will be getting a Pokemon prize pack. Uh, I have assembled a bunch of Pokemon goodies, um, ranging from toys to cards. And I will be personally sending that to the first person who sends us in a top ten. And I will throw wow, in, that's awesome. and I will throw in an extra Pokemon goodie if one of the Pokemon games is legitimately in their top ten and why it's in their top ten. I will make sure that they get an extra goodie if they can legitimately tell me why Pokemon is in their top ten. I'm uh, jealous. <laughs> yeah, I figured, you know, with a bonus episode they should get a real bonus. Secondly, uh, the way to go ahead and send us your top 10 list is we now have a website where we will be hosting these splat zones along with the other features that we post on the YouTube channel. Uh, you know, the YouTube channel being the Nice1983 YouTube channel. So if you go to nice1983.wix.com slash game collecting and send us your top 10, the first person to hit us up with a response will receive that Pokemon prize pack. So we're excited and we will we're gonna read your top ten on the show and we're gonna name drop you. So if you don't want your name read, give us the gamer tag and we will go ahead and we'll put the rules on the website. It will be in the blog section of the website. So look forward to that. And we look forward to hearing from you guys on your top ten. Alright guys like Mario After Party said, that's gonna be it for our show today. But before we sign off, we have to get you those social those social media links. So you can hit me up on Twitter at nice one nine eight three. You can hit us up on Facebook at nice one nine eight three slash game collecting. You can hit us up by email at nice one nine eight three at gmail.com. And like I said earlier, we do have a website now, which is super exciting. Go check it out. Nice one, 983.wix.com slash game collecting. That's it for our show today. So you know how we like to sign off. Stay fresh! Stay fresh! Deuces!